theyeshiva.net. Any person who is familiar, even superficially, with the Sefer Torah, with what we call a Torah scroll, the original text of the Hebrew Bible, of the Chumash, the Chamisha Chumash Torah, the five books of Moshe, the Pentateuch, the Tanakh, is familiar with the fact that it doesn't contain any kind of punctuation which we are familiar with in all other texts, manuscripts, and books. You'll open up a Torah, there are no periods, no exclamation points, no question marks, no commas, no semicolons, no colons, no hyphens, or the like. So essentially, when you open the text, it's a very, very difficult text to read. Of course, in our printed Chumashim today, we have nekudas, we have vowels, we have commas and colons and hyphens and forms of punctuation which allow you to distinguish, which allow you to ascertain, which allow you to dissect and understand. But in the text that Jews had and have for thousands of years, these punctuations don't exist. Where does a sentence begin? Where does it end? Where does a paragraph begin? Where does it end? Yes, words are divided from each other. How do you pronounce the words? What are the sentences? Is there a question mark? Is it a question? Is it an exclamation point? None of this is in the text. However, there are two forms of punctuation that do exist in the Torah to indicate the beginning and the end of a topic. That exists. And these are known as spaces. Revachim in Hebrew, they're called a revach, a space in this Torah scroll that gives indication to one issue and one issue only. A topic ended and a new one began. And there are two types of spaces in a Torah scroll. One is called a stuma, and one is called a psucha. Stuma means closed, satsum, plugged, closed, sealed. Pasuach means open, like a pesach is a door, an entrance, it's open. Or it's not open, but it's made to be open. That's what a door, the function of a door is, to be able to open it and then to close it. So one is called a stuma, which means it's sealed, and one is called a psucha, which means it's open. Any chumash that you will learn or read, you will see in the middle of a parsha, very often you will see a pei or a samach. And very often people see those letters and they don't know what they mean. A pasuk ends and there's a pei and then you go to the next pasuk. A pasuk ends, there's a samach and you'll go to the next pasuk. The same is true with a parsha. Throughout the entire chumash you'll see constantly pays and samachs and pays and samachs and pays and samachs. Sometimes there is brief, a brief gap between them. Sometimes it's pretty often, it's pretty frequent. Frequent. The reason they do pay and samach is it's just an acronym. Pay stands for psucha, which means open, and samach stands for stuma. Samach would be an S, and pay would be a P, which stands for setuma, which means sealed. What is the significance of this? When a topic in Torah comes to an end and a new topic is about to be introduced, the word that finishes the last topic would not end at the end of the line as it would usually end. You finish the line and you start a new line. Rather, it would stop anywhere in the middle of the line or the beginning of the line and the rest of the line remains open. The new topic begins on the next line. This is called a psucha, an open-ended line. So if a topic finishes in Chumash and the scribe is writing and he finishes the topic, say, after two words, he won't continue on the same line as he would usually do with the next verse. He will leave the entire line, the remainder of the line, open, pasuach, open, an open-ended line, and the next topic will begin in the next line. That's called a psucha. What happens if a new topic begins, but it's not completely new? It's related. It's new, but it's not completely new. It's still connected, even though it's a new topic. Then the line is not open at the end. You don't leave the line open till the end and begin only on the second line. That would be a psucha. What you do then is you leave a significant space in the middle of the line, the space that occupies 
the length of nine letters. So you finish a topic, say you finish the topic on a line, the second word, you leave a little space, a little gap of nine letters, and you continue the new topic on the same line after the gap. That's called a stuma, meaning it's a closed-ended line. The opening is in the middle of the line. You don't leave the whole line open. If you leave the rest of the line open, it's called a psucha. If the line is closed on both sides, there's just a gap in the middle, it's called a stuma, because even though there's an empty space, it's sealed from both sides. That's why it's called sitsuma. I copied here an, an image. I hope you'll be able to... Uh, ascertain it. This is from Parshas, uh, Parshas Truma, just as an example. And you'll see first a Pucha, and then you'll see a Stuma. Let me see if I can make it a little bigger. Okay. You see here, this is an example of what? A Pucha. You see the word is you should place on the table of the Mishkan a bread always throughout the week, and that bread was eaten on Shabbos. After this, the Torah finishes the discussion of building the table and goes off to a new topic, which is building the menorah, the candelabra. So there's no spaces between verses. You've got to figure that out on your own. No hyphens, no colons, no semicolons, no comma, as we said. But... The topic ended, and you have now the space. You have now the space, and the space, I don't care how many letters, you could fit in maybe more than nine letters, but you have to leave the line open. This is called psucha, and the next line we will start with a new topic, va'asisa menoira zahav tar. That's an example of a psucha. On the same page of the Sefer Torah, in this copy that I, uh, that I copied, you will have the other one, which is... <coughs> After the Torah finishes talking about the Menorah, look at this, you see? What do you have here? You have here a stuma. It's plugged from both sides. There is an empty space in the middle, but it's plugged from both sides. This is basically the minimum of approximately, in this Sefer Torah, what this Sefer felt was around nine letters. And that's called a stuma. This is going from the menorah to the roof of the Bishkan. Now you'll ask, why from the shulchan to the menorah, psucha, and from the menorah to the roof of the Mishkan, a stuma, a stuma. That people, you have to understand every time when the Torah chooses a psucha or a stuma, why exactly this is seen as a new topic, this is seen as new and yet related topic. But this is the only punctuation, the only sign of some type of getting you comfortable with the text, where you're not forced to decipher everything on your own, that the Torah gives us, and the rest we have tradition for that has been passed on, and it's part of Torah Shabal Peh, how to read, how to pronounce, where a verse ends, where a verse begins. But this is clear in the text itself, a psucha and a stuma. You'll open up any chumash, any parsha, from the first till the last, and you'll see constantly, Pei, Samach, Pei, Samach, Samach, Pei. You'll see it in every parsha, sometimes infrequently, sometimes very frequently. There's one exception. The exception to that is Parsha's Vayetze. Parsha's Vayetze has absolutely no spaces. Not a psucha and not even a stuma. Not an open-ended line, not a closed-ended line. Absolutely no spaces. Now you would think, maybe, if it was one topic... One story that is very self-contained, that would make sense. But the truth is, Parshas Vayetze occupies a very long span of time under different and challenging circumstances. It opens up with the words, Vayetze Yaakov, Mibe'er Shava Vayelech Harana. Yaakov leaves his parents' home in the city of Be'er Sheva in the land of Israel. And he travels, he walks, he hikes, he takes a walk, he moves to Kharan. Kharan is, of course, in Mesopotamia, in northern Iraq, what was called, uh, at the time, Kharan. I think till today they identify a place that is known as Haran, H-R-Haran, H-A-R-A-N, which is probably in close proximity as the place of Kharan in the days of yore, and I think many archaeological excavations have been, there done, have been done there as well. And he travels to Kharan. 
On the way, he sleeps. He has a dream. He wakes up from his dream. He continues to move. He comes to the well. He meets Rachel. He meets his future father-in-law. He works seven years. He's deceived. He marries Leah. He marries Rachel. Bila, Zilpah has children. The whole Yolei Chelech stories about his children. And then his stories with his negotiations with Lavan about a wage. Ultimately, it occupies a time, a span of time, which is 20 years, two decades, the full 20 years that Yaakov spent in the house of Lavan. He wasn't planning to be there for so long, but he was there for seven years working for his wife, Rachel, and then he remains there another 14 years. He works another seven years, because the first seven years turned out to be for Leah. He works another seven years after he already married Leah and married Rachel, and then he stays on another six years. Twenty years Yaakov is in Lovan's house until he decides, with God's consent or instructions and the consent of Rachel and Leah, it's time to flee, it's time to say goodbye to Lovan. That's true, that is true. If you include the other 14 years when he was in the yeshiva of Shema Naver, you're dealing with 34 years, even though that's not explicit in Chumash. Vayetze ends on a completely different note. Lovan pursues Yaakov, he meets him, they make a treaty, they say goodbye to each other in peace with reconciliation. Lovan wakes up in the morning, he kisses his sons and his daughters, his grandchildren and his daughters and his granddaughters, and he goes back home. Yaakov now moves on. Yaakov halach ledarkai. And just as angels came into his dream on the way out, now angels once again meet him on his way back from Charon, from Lavan, back home where he's going to come to his father. His mother already passed away, but he's going to come be with his father Yitzchak for many, many years to come. Parshas Vayetze is a long period of time, and a lot has happened. He comes as a bachelor, as a bacher, as a single man, and he comes out with a huge, huge family, and a lot of wealth, and a lot of possession, and a lot of experience, a lot of interesting, fascinating, challenging, and I'm sure sweet experiences. And yet the Torah doesn't find it necessary even once to allow us to breathe. <laughs> Give me a break, pun intended. Psuch and stuma basically take a breath. Take a deep breath. Give yourself a break. Stop. Vayetzi, there's no stopping. There's no break. There's no space. Not an open-ended, not a closed-ended, not a psucha, not a stum, not a single one. This is so curious. It begs for an explanation. There are many parishes that cover a few days, cover a few months, cover a year. This covers 34 years of Yaakov's life, explicitly 20 years of Yaakov's life really 34 years of his life. And it's not just he sat 34 years and did the same thing. A lot was going on. He built an entire family, which is the foundation of Knesset Yisrael, the foundation of the Jewish nation for eternity. And yet, it's all covered in one sentence, so to speak. When you read it, it looks like literally one sentence, one verse that never stops. What is the meaning of this? What is the message here? Of course you have to stop. There are psukim, there are parshis, there's sedris, there's aliyas, rishin, sheni, shlishi. But the Torah is trying to say something. There is a fascinating medrash about Yaakov Avinu's 20 years in the house of Lavan. It says when Yaakov left Be'er Sheva and he came to Charon, on the way he encountered a place and he slept there because the sun set. He took the stones, he surrounded his head, and he slept in that space. And of course, the sages who were so sensitive to nuance always detected any subtle aberration, even the slightest of unnecessary words or words that don't belong here. What is the meaning? It could have said he found that he encountered a place. He went to sleep there because the sun has set. He took the stones and he went to sleep. He slept in that place. And they say, over there he slept. 
but obviously it's coming to exclude other places where he did not sleep. Finally, in this place, by Yishkov, here he slept. Other places, like somebody once said, I sleep like a baby, I wake up every half an hour. By Yishkov, by Makim, Havdil, other places he didn't sleep. Where? So the Chazal say that for 14 years, leaving his parents' home on the way to Charan, he stopped for 14 years, nice little break, to study in the yeshiva of two great personalities, the yeshiva known as Shem and Aver. This was a yeshiva with their students and their disciples and their legacy and their teachings. And there he didn't sleep. Maybe he snoozed off, but he didn't go to sleep. He was learning for 14 years. There's another opinion in the Medrash. Here he slept, but the next 20 years he would not sleep. In the house of Lavan, he wouldn't be able to sleep. As he tells Lavan, he tells Lavan, Esrim Shana Noichi Secha. I have been 20 years in your home, and I did not stop working. Vatidad Shnosi Me'enoi. Sleep has been removed from my eyes, meaning I never got a good full night, normal night of sleep because of the endless sweat and labor and work I did for you. As Yaakov Avinu tells Lavan when he finally meets him and he shares with him a piece of his mind and a piece of his heart, he says, I never ate any of your rams, none of your animals miscarried, I took care of them. I never allowed any animal to be devoured by an undomesticated beast. If something was missing, I paid for it. If it was stolen by day, if it was stolen by night. He says, by day I was scorched by the heat and at night I was consumed by the ice. Day and night I worked for you, thick and thin, cold weather, hot weather, 20 years in your home, 14 years I worked for two, two of your girls and another six years for your sheep, and you deceived me 10 times, you deceived me 10 times when it came to my wage. If not for the God of my father and the God of my grandfather, I would have been today broke, I would have had nothing. They have saved me from your uh, deceit. That's what Yaakov tells his father-in-law at a moment of truth when they will ultimately part ways. So the Medrash says, Vayishka Bamakamahu, this was almost his last night of sleep. When he left home and he went to sleep in that place, Bamakim, that place which Chazal identify as Haramiria, the mountain of Meiria where the Beis Hamikdash would later stand, the place where Avram Avinu offered his father at the Akedah, that's where he slept. That's where he also had his dream of a ladder standing on earth, reaching heaven, and the angels going up and down. And Hashem standing above and telling him, I will be with you and I will guard you, and I will give you this land, blessing him and protect, promising him protection. And after that dream, he moves on to go to meet Lavan and to meet Rachel and to stay there, and he would be there for two decades. So the Medrash says, here he slept, but 20 years later he didn't sleep. And then the Medrash continues, Umahaya Oimer. What would he say? What did he say for these 20 years? Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi says, he used to say, Tesvav shir ha-malaz tehillim. The 15 chapters that all begin with the words shir ha a song of ascent, a song of ma'alot, of steps, of going up. There are 15 of them in Tehillim. They begin in chapter Kuf Chaf, chapter 120, and the following 15 chapters all begin with the verse, with the words, Shir Hamalas. That's what he used to say. Why? So the Medrash says, because one of the Shir Hamalas in Kuf Chavdalet begins, Shir Hamalas Ladavid, Lule Hashem Shahaya Lanu, Yoimar No Yisra, Lule Hashem Shahaya Lanu Bekuma Leinu Adam Azaychayim Blauno. This is a song for David who says, Yisrael used to say, if not for God who was with me, Israel says, if not for God who was with me, if Hashem wasn't with me, when man stood up against me, I would have been swallowed up alive. I would have drowned. I would have been consumed by the raging tsunamis of life. He says, who is this Yisrael? Yisrael Sava. It's our ancient father, Yaakov Avinu. David is repeating a poem or the theme of a poem, if you will, perhaps it wasn't verbatim, that it was already said by Yaakov. Another view in the Medrash is, Rabbi Shmuel's view is, Rabbi Shmuel bar Nachman, Yaakov said the whole Tehillim. It says, 
Yoishev Tehilois Yisrael, you holy one, sit on the praises of Israel. Yisrael here again is a reference to Yaakov Avinu. He was the one who would say Tehilois Yisrael. He would say Tehillim. He said the whole Tehillim. Now when the Medrash asks, what did Yaakov say during this time? It doesn't mean, what did he do for 20 years? Yaakov clearly says what he did for 20 years. He worked. And he worked tirelessly and selflessly. And he worked with blood and sweat and tears. By day, he says, he was scorched by the burning, raging heat. At night, by the frost, frostbite. By Lyoy Machalani Choyre Vekerach Baloyla. I was eaten, scorched by heat at night, and Kerach by frost, by ice, by cold at night. He says, clearly, for 20 years, I worked with your flock, I worked with your herds, I worked with your cattle, and I didn't sleep. What does the Medrash mean, Maha Yoimer? What did he say? What he said for 20 years? I mean, he said whatever he said for 20 years. What question is it? Do we think he was there 20 years and he didn't have what to do? So the Medrash says, how did he occupy himself for 20 years? He clearly says what he did. And he says that he worked by day and by night. He was in charge on Lavan's huge, huge wealth, all of his assets, all of his cattle, all of the animals, which was then the symbol and the actual meaning of wealth at the time. And Yaakov was the sole person, or certainly on top, who was in charge. What's the Mahaya Oimer? What did he say? Obviously, the Medrash is asking not what he said to occupy his time, but what did he say to remain sane? What did he say to remain afloat? What did he do for those 20 years when sleep was depriving him, when he was deprived from sleep? when he was in a relationship with a very, very complicated figure, who was also a father-in-law. Sometimes you're in a relationship with a complicated figure who's a stranger. But when it's with your father-in-law, you're intertwined and interconnected. And I'm sure Yaakov couldn't even speak openly to Rachel about her father, because even when you think you could tell everything to your spouse about their father, you are sometimes wrong. It's a mistake that sometimes couples make with good intentions. You have a certain opinion about your in-laws. Present company excluded, of course. And you want to share it with your spouse. And in your eyes, you're completely righteous, but sometimes you have to be sensitive. For you, it's a shvigar. For your wife or your husband, it's his mother or her mother. The same as with a father. Okay, every situation has to be judged, but people have to be sensitive because sometimes you say something hurtful to your spouse about their parents and you can't take it back so easily. And these are their parents. You can't disown your parents. But Yaakov himself knew who Lavan was. So the Medrash is asking, what did he say for 20 years to keep him stimulated, inspired, to remain above the tremendous difficulties and challenges that he endured in the house of Lavan? This was an exile. He had to leave the cocoon of his parents. What did he do in order to be able to survive and in order to thrive? So the Medrash gets two opinions. One is he said the whole Tehillim. And one is he said 15 chapters of Tehillim. Now we can understand the opinion of Reb Shmuel, the son of Reb Nachman, who says that he used to say the whole Tehillim. It was a situation where Yaakov couldn't occupy himself with intense and intricate learning, as he did during the 14 years in the yeshiva of Shema Nevar. As he says himself, I couldn't sleep, I was working and working and working. So instead, Yaakov Avinu, instead of learning, he said the Tehillim, and in fact... David HaMelech asked Hashem that saying Tehillim should be equivalent to learning Negoyim and Halois, which are the complicated chapters in the Mishnah about laws of purity and impurity and the power of Tehillim is equivalent to that. So Yaakov threw Tehillim, the messages of Tehillim, the faith of Tehillim, the connection to Tehillim, the intimacy with God through Tehillim, and the value of Tehillim, he remained, he remained not only intact, but he could remain in his full majesty and splendor spiritually, emotionally, physically, and psychologically. What is the idea, however, that he said 15 chapters of Shir HaMalis from the whole Tehillim? Tehillim has 150 kapitlach, 150 chapters, but from the whole Tehillim he said 15. Again, the whole Tehillim I understand. Tehillim is a book that even till today, but throughout the generations, this was like the natural book that Jews would fall on. Now, unfortunately, today many people say Tehillim, but they don't understand it. The Hebrew of Tehillim is extremely, extremely refined. It's very, very poetic. It's extremely sophisticated. And it's complex, nuanced language, which is why 
It's always a good idea to have a tehillim in the language that you understand, whether it's Yiddish or English or French or Russian. And today they have tehillims where right under the Hebrew words they have immediately the translation. You don't have to look to the other side of the page. And then when you do a capital tehillim, either simultaneously or before or after, you could read the translation and get a feel not only for the actual words, but also for the actual meaning. But Jews always found in Tehillim, especially <coughs> Jewish mothers, Jewish grandmothers, Jewish women throughout the generations, found in Tehillim a book where somehow they felt at home. When they were happy, they said Tehillim. And when they were sad, they said Tehillim. When they were worried about their children, does that still exist? When they were worried about their children, they said Tehillim. When they were worried about <coughs> their grandchildren, they said Tehillim. And when they celebrated and wanted to give thanks, they also said Tehillim. It was like almost a homecoming for the Jewish soul. In Tehillim, everyone felt like almost their own diary. The Chazal say, David HaMelech is called Ne'im Zmiro Yisrael, the sweet singer of the Jewish people. His voice is not his own voice. It captures the voice of the nation. It captures the voice of Knesset Yisrael collectively and individually. There's a nusach of Yehiratzin that many people say at the end of Tehillim, and they say, Yehiratzin, that the words that I said should be like David HaMelech himself said these very words. It's not just some feign, some, some strange wish. It's, I'm saying it, not David HaMelech. It's because the, mal, the connection continues, the relationship continues. He spoke it not only for himself, he captured his own life, but the great poets and divine poets especially capture not only their own lives, but the lives of of, of Knesset Yisrael, of their generation, and of previous generations, and of subsequent generations. And here it turns out that it already originates in Yaakov Avinu, however that tradition happened. Does it mean he said the Tehillim as we have it? Probably not. David HaMelech wrote it, and other people wrote it. There were ten writers for the book of Tehillim. Tehillim doesn't have one writer. Tehillim has ten writers. You'll see many of the Kapitlech begin with different names. Lam Natseach, Livnei. Kairach, Mizmar, Mizmar, La'asaf, etc. There were ten writers who wrote Tehillim. David HaMelech was one of them. But perhaps many were given over from Yaakov. Perhaps the theme of Tehillim was communicated by Yaakov. However you want to interpret this medrash. But we can understand that Yaakov, the first Jew who went into exile, is, finds comfort and solace and meaning and value in Tehillim. But the first opinion of the medrash is very interesting. From the whole Tehillim, he chose the 15 Shir HaMaloysin, the 15 chapters that always begin with the word shir, which is a song. From the word shira, like Shabbos shira, az yashir marisha, lashur means, lashir means to sing. Shira is a song. Fifteen chapters consecutively that all begin with the word shir hamalis. What is the significance of this? The chidah, Rabbeinu Chaim Yosef David Azuloi, was one of the great Sephardic rabbis and sages of the 18th century. He lived in the 1700s, a world traveler. He lived in Italy, and he traveled the world, and he was a prolific writer. The Chida, I think, wrote more than 100, 100 books, 100 volumes. An extraordinary uh, writer, thinker, teacher, a great gun. Chidaz, Chaim Yosef David Azuloi, that is the acronym of his name. The Chida has a commentary on Tehillim. It's called Yosef Tehillus. His name was Yosef, Chaim Yosef David. So he has a sefer called Yosef Tehillus. And on chapter Kuf Chaf, which is the first year Amalus, the Chidah comments about this. And he says that the 15 Shir Amalus that David Amalek said represent the 15 years in which the Avais lived together in this world. You see, Avram Avinu, how old was Avram Avinu when his wife gave birth to Yitzchak? Sarah was 90, he was 100. Avram Avinu, the Torah says in Parshat Chai, Sarah passed away at the age of 175. So Yitzchak was 75 years old when Avram Avinu passed away. How old was Yitzchak when Rivka gave birth to the twins Yaakov and Esau? The Torah says in Parshat told us 60. But Yitzchak ben Shishim Shana Beledis Osam, 60 years old. Which means that Yaakov Avinu was 15 years old when Yitzchak turned 75. He was born when his father was 60. At the 75th anniversary of Yitzchak's birth, Yaakov Avinu was a young 15-year-old, and that is the year that Yavram Avinu passed away. 
because Avram was 175, Yitzchak was born when he was 100, so Avram was passed away when Yitzchak was 75, which means Yaakov was 15. This means that the three patriarchs coexisted together in this world for 15 years. The first 15 years of Yaakov Avinu's life, he wasn't only in the bosom of his father Yitzchak and his mother Rivka, who loved him so dearly, but he was also naturally in the bosom of his grandparents, of Avram Avinu, I should say. Sarah passed away, of course, <laughs> before Yitzchak was married, so Yaakov Avinu never saw Sarah. But he was in the bosom of Avram. Avram educated him. Avram taught him. Avram molded him. And like a grandfather, any good Zaydi, never mind a Zaydi like Avram Avinu, who was the kindest person alive, not only to his children and family, but to everybody, and certainly to his own grandson, even though it's not always taken, shouldn't always be taken for granted. Some people are kind to the world. They don't know how to be kind to their children and grandchildren. For the world, they're the kindest people at home. They're mamish. Uh, I won't finish the sentence. But certainly Avram Avinu understood better than that. <laughs> Kindness always starts at home. You're not kind to the rest of the world. And for your own children, you become a chayra. But in any case, Avram Avinu, obviously, needless to say, doesn't go into this equation, chas v'shalom. So Yaakov Avinu was nurtured and molded and inspired for 15 years in the bosom of Avram and in the bosom of Yitzchak. Of course, when Avram Avinu passes away, it's also when Esav chooses his path in life. As Chazal say, after Avram Avinu's death, Esav also turned away, which is also very interesting, but it's not for this year, but the relationship between, not only between Esav and Yitzchak, but between Esav and Avram Avinu himself. So the Chidah says that the 15 Shir Hamaloisen represent the 15 years, the 15 Kapitlach of Tehillim, 120, Kuf Chaf, and it goes throughout, it goes to, uh, it goes, 15, very good. Zay <laughs> good, zay <Zaya> good. Kuf <clears throat> Lamedalet. <laughs> right? Kuf <laughs> Lamedalet. 120 through 134. So you have the 15 years of, of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov living together. This gives us insight why Yaakov is saying the Shir HaMalais here. Why Yaakov during these 20 years is doing these 15 Shir HaMalais. Let's try to understand this. But in order to appreciate it, let's raise one more dilemma. For f- There's an issue with chronology here that perturbed our sages very heavily. It was very confusing. I'll do it very briefly, but the issue is as follows. Yaakov Avinu, as we said, was born when Yitzchak was 60. When we make the calculation of Yaakov growing up Yaakov leaving the house of his father, going to Be'er Sheva, going to Charon, coming back home, remaining in Eretz Yisrael, and then ultimately going to Egypt. In Egypt, he will identify himself to Paroi as a man who is 130 years old. He will remain in Egypt for 17 years and pass away at the age of 147. When we go through the chronology of Chumash, the age of Yaakov when he left his parents' home, 63. And he ultimately is moving to Charon. And we go through the whole process, 20 years by Lavan, two two years on the way back, 17 years in Eretz Yisrael, uh, 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 17 years in Mitzrayim, but years in Eretz Yisrael, when Yosef ultimately, till Yosef is, is, uh, is abducted and sold, we have a gap. We have a gap of 14 years that are not accounted for. And the Chazal didn't know what happened to those 14 years. They disappeared. They're not here. The Torah goes through his life, and we could see the years, and we're missing 14. Rashi is the one who makes this. Is there a chumash? Anybody has a chumash? Do you mind in the back of you there's a blue chumash on the bottom shelf on the right? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Rashi makes the calculation at the end of Parshas told us 
last week's parsha, a very, very long Rashi. He shows how Yaakov was 63 when he left his father and his mother. How do we know he was 63? So the cheshben for this is a very interesting cheshben because that time when he left, when he ran away from Esau, the Pesach says Esau went to marry the daughter of Yishmael, right? Esau married the daughter of Yishmael, and they were, of course, relatives because Yishmael was Yitzchak's brother, half-brother. So Yishmael was Esau's uncle, and he married his first cousin, Yishmael's daughter, but suddenly she's identified as the sister of Nevoyos, Obviously, her father died after the betrothal at some point, and that's why suddenly she becomes the sister of Nevoyas. He becomes in charge for the wedding expenses, for Kailil, for whatever, Yerushalayim, and so forth. And uh, Yishmael is now gone, and this is the point where Yaakov runs away. Yishmael was 14 years older than Yitzchak. The Torah identifies so clearly. So if Yitzchak was... 60 when Yaakov was born, Yishmael at that time was 74, 14 years old. The Torah says that Yishmael lived for 137 years. That means when Yishmael died, and Yishmael died, and he was 14 years older than Yitzchak, Yishmael died at the age of 137. How old was Yaakov? Yaakov was, 60, Yaakov was 63 years old. That's the Cheshbon. It's not so complicated. Yitzchak was 14 years younger than Yishmael. Yitzchak was 60 when he gave birth, when he became the father of Yaakov. Yishmael was 74 at the time. Yishmael died at the age of 137. So go from 74 to 137. You have 63 years. And that's the period that Esav went to marry Yishmael's daughter, and Yaakov leaves. So Yaakov is 63 when he leaves. He goes to Lavan's house, and he's in Lavan's house for 20 years. Years. So now when you go through the whole Cheshben and you see Yosef was born after 14 years in the house of Lavan. Yosef was born after 14 years in the house of Lavan. It says clearly that Yosef was 30 years old when he became the king. Yosef was 30 years old when he became the king. Yosef was 17. He was abducted. He went down to Egypt. At the age of 30, he becomes the king. And then there's seven years of famine. I'm sorry, seven years of plenty, two years of famine. And after that, Yaakov comes to Egypt, and Yaakov says, I'm 130 years old. And we have here a discrepancy of 14 years that are missing for. That's the big problem. So Chazal had to struggle with this. What happened? Why does the Torah delete these years? And this is where they famously came and taught the tradition that they received, obviously, that for 14 years he was hiding. And it's not explicit. He was hiding. <laughs> where was he hiding? In the yeshiva, and he was learning the yeshiva of Shem and Aver. That's where he was. And this makes up for the 14 years. And that's the first opinion. He slept here, but he didn't sleep those 14 years. But here we have to have a fundamental question. What did he, we ask a fundamental question. What did he learn in the yeshiva of Shem and Aver? that he did not learn from his father and grandfather. He wasn't a two-year-old boy at this time. He wasn't a bar mitzvah boy. He was 63 years old. 63 years with Yitzchak. Yitzchak is the patriarch of the Jewish people, the successor of Avram. 15 years with Avram. What did he go 14 years to yeshiva to? There's a rabbi in, in Atlanta for many years, Rabbi Feldman, Emmanuel Feldman. He wrote a book called Tales Out of a Shul. Very humorous book. So he describes that when he came to Atlanta in the early 1950s, he has a shul that he created, a shul, I think, Beth, uh, Beth Jacob, right? It was, uh, he, he was hired in the shul in the early 1950s. And one day, one day, he was, after Mayriv, he was sitting in the library of the shul and he was learning. And he saw that the president walked by and steered into the room. Like, you'll, 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 you'll find, you know, a... A, a, a tribe of penguins on your porch. He's steering into the library at this rabbi, like completely astounded and overwhelmed. Okay, he continued to learn, and the president uh, continues. Later, you heard at the next board meeting, the president said, I have to bring up a serious, serious issue. And this is not simple, friends, he said. 
The other night, it was after the services, and I happened to walk by the library, and I saw the rabbi learning, and he was learning with a lot of diligence. You could see he was trying hard to master the information. And this is very, very disturbing, because he told us when he came that he graduated. He graduated from rabbinic school. But obviously, there was deception here. <laughs> and of course, he was trying to bring out the type of, the type of uh, ignorance he was dealing with to explain to people, <laughs> as they used to say in camp after learning class, learning never ends, learning never ends, but now it's time for sports. I understand that learning never ends. My question is, you went to a new yeshiva, Shema Neighbor. What's there in that yeshiva? What did you learn there? From the age of 63 till the age of 73 plus four years, 74 till the age of 77, when you're going to end up by love on and start a new chapter in your life. What was it there in the yeshiva of Shem and Aver? The Torah doesn't even mention it. Something happened. What information did they give him? What inspiration? What depth? What wisdom that he didn't get here? The answer to all of this has to do with the fact that this is the first journey in Chumash of a person who is forced to leave the cocoon of his nurturing parents. Yaakov had an unbelievable relationship with his mother, as we can see, and quite a good relationship with his father as well, Yitzchak. We could see the blessing that Yitzchak gives Avram Avinu before he sends him to find a wife in Haran. May God give you the blessing of Avraham. In other words, Yitzchak understood that Yaakov was his heir. There was no deception about this, as explained last week. And he leaves this cocoon, and he goes to a new place. He goes to Haran. Chazal identify Haran from the word Haroin. Haroin means anger, wrath, ire. In other words, he's going to a place where there's a lot of room for moral and spiritual disintegration. He's alone. He will not have his father, of course, not his grandfather, not a mother, not a grandmother. Nobody. He will be completely on his own. And, in the, in the, indeed, his first Kabbalah's ponim, his first reception is he discovers the deceitfulness of a man who would become his future father-in-law, Lavan. That is the situation. Vayetze Yaakov Meber Shava. That's how Vayetze opens up. It's not just he left the town. Vayetze. He now leaves. He leaves Be'er Sheva. Be'er Sheva means the well. Be'er is a well. Sheva comes from the word Sheva, which is seven. It's also the word for Shvur, for oath. The Erechaim and commentators say it's also a symbol for every soul that has to leave and emerge from Be'er, from a well, a living wellspring, Sheva. Chazal say there is an oath that's given to every child before it's born, Mashbi in in the womb of our mother as we learn the Torah with a candle burning on our head. And the Gemara says, in Nida daflamid, before the child emerges, there's an oath, Tehit Tzadik Va'alti Yerusha. The word Shvua comes from the word Va'achalta V'savata. You should be satiated. An oath here is not intended only as an oath. It's intended as giving you the resources, satiating you. V'savata, Sviya means satiation, to be able to fulfill your mission. Yaakov now leaves a spiritual womb and a physical womb. The womb of his parents' home, of his parents' environment. Vayele Harana, And he's on his own. And here we see a fascinating thing. He has a dream and there's a ladder. And in the ladder the angels are going up and going down. Ask Rashi. Angels are in heaven. They got to go down. And then they have to go up. It says, Go up and then go down. First they got to go down and then they go up. What does Rashi say? The angels of Eretz Yisrael, who were escorting him out, had to go back. And new angels had to come down. What does this mean? What Rashi is saying is, the angels who protect you in the Holy Land can't be the same angels who protect you outside of the Holy Land. The Malachim of the Holy Land had to go up. They had to leave. Why couldn't they stay? Because you need a different type of angel. The angel, of course, is a metaphor. It's a symbol don't understand the angel as some Lakshan Kugel leader with a lot of wings 
who's flying around in a white mink gown or coat, but the angel here obviously represents a certain spiritual halo that encompasses, that engulfs the human spirit. The angel of Eretz Yisrael could not suffice for chutzlar, it's for outside, for the diaspora. They have to go back. He needs a new set of angels. How do we see this so clearly? Because when he finishes his journey on his way back, at the end of Ayatse, what does it say? As he's leaving love and he's about to come back to Eretz Yisrael, Vayivgu boy malache Elohim. The angels met him, so Rashi says, now the angels of Israel, of Eretz Yisrael, came out to greet him. Once upon a time, 20 years ago, they left. They went up, and now they came back as the angels of Chutzlaretz gave way for the angels of Eretz Yisrael. What is the symbol in this? What does it mean? The angels are leaving. Why can't you have the same angels? What do you need a change of the guards? Is this the Buckingham Palace or another palace where the guards are tired or exhausted? But what it means is the energy... The stamina, the resources, the wisdom that you need in one place will not suffice for another place. Sometimes people have tremendous resources to deal with one type of situation. And they excel, and they excel perfectly there. But when there's a transition made, and they face a new reality, they are completely dumbfounded. They absolutely don't have the tools. And one of the great mistakes we do is, we use the ancient tools to deal with a new situation for which those tools, those angels, although they were unbelievable angels, they can't help us. I need to be able to have the Malachi Chutzlaretz to be able to sustain me. I have to be able to have the wisdom of the angels in the diaspora. How am I going to be here? For this, Yaakov spent 14 years in a new type of yeshiva. Avram and Yitzchak lived in the Holy Land. Avram traveled, but his center became the Holy Land, and he became a prince. Avram was a world-renowned spiritual towering figure. Yitzchak was an oil to me. He wasn't even allowed to leave. He wasn't even allowed to leave Eretz Yisrael. As the Chazal say, he was an oil to me, a sacred offering who could not leave the holiness of Eretz Yisrael, and that's where Yaakov grew up. For the first time now, a Jew will go into exile. A Jew is going to say goodbye to the cocoon, to the sacredness of the spiritual bosom of Eretz Yisrael, and he's going to go into a new place, Charan, on his own. Yaakov Avinu knew the Torah of Eretz Yisrael, but where do you learn the Torah of Chutzlaretz? Yaakov Avinu knew the Torah of growing up in the environment, in the four cubits of his father Yitzchak, his mother Rivka, his grandfather Avram, the house molded by Sarah. But how do you grow? And how do you raise a family? How do you get married? How do you build an infrastructure in an opposite home, an opposite environment? You're alone, you're stranded. It's so easy to forfeit who you are, your depth, your light, your personality, your values. Who for this he went to a new yeshiva. 14 years, Yudalit Shona. He spent in shame and neighbor. Shame was an expert. Shame was the oldest son of who? Of Noyach. Shame knew what it means that a whole world, gate Meshiga, a whole world disintegrates in front of your eyes, destroys itself. The flood didn't have to destroy the world. The world destroyed itself. The flood was just the physical realization of that self-destruction. Sometimes a person becomes so addicted, their brains are fried. Nothing has to destroy them. They already did the job. The mabel was the aftermath of what happened inside. The world vomited out itself. You know, when you get sick of yourself, you vomit out yourself, so to speak. Shame saw it all happen. He remained, though. He remained connected. Noyach ish tzaddik. He will ultimately become one of the great-great-grandfathers of Avram Avinu, who was Aver. Aver watched the Dor HaFlogah. He watched the Tower of Babel. He saw another society disintegrate in a very different way. The two sins of Noyach, the opening and the end. The opening is anarchy, the Mabel, anarchy, and the end of Parshish Noyach is socialism, communism. Everybody has to be the same. The two cardinal sins of society in the beginning of Noyach, absolute anarchy. And at the end of Noyach, absolute dictatorship and control. Both destroy themselves. Shame and Aver had a yeshiva. Yaakov Avinu needs to get smicha. He needs to get training by Shema Neva's yeshiva. The Ostrov Tzerebbe 
in his Sefer, and also Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky in his commentary, Emes Yaakov and Parshas Vayetze both make this point. Yaakov Avinu was going to learn the Torah of Chutzlaretz, the Torah of fragmentation. I know how to deal with wholeness. How do I deal with fragmentation? I know how to deal with a world that is uniform, cohesive, integrated, a world that is unified. But how do I deal with a world that's disintegrated? How do I deal with people who say one thing and mean something else? How do I deal with a society in which if I am not corrupt, if I am not dishonest, I can't survive, or at least they think I can't survive? How do I deal with a situation where I'm the only one sometimes? I feel completely alone. How do I deal with this? And how am I going to raise children who are going to be healthy and vibrant and be able to develop a sense of, of selfhood and commitment and dedication? He goes for 14 years to shame a neighbor. He learns there that Torah. And then he comes to Lavan. He comes to Lavan's house, Lavan's house. He's already a different person. But now he actually has to practice it. Now he actually has to live it. And now comes the great challenge. As we all know, you could learn theories from Heint Bismargen. And then when you face the trauma, kaput. There's people who sit in seminar, seminars and workshops for decades. They read, they're top experts. And then one thing triggers them, and they're kaput. There's nothing left. They hit the cheese danish, and they binge away for day and night, especially with the pain and the disappointment of not being able to live up to the great ideals of what they studied and what they mastered. And at this point, Yaakov Avinu knows that it's time to say Shir Hamalas. It's time to sing the 15 Shir Hamalas. It's not only he kept on repeating these 15 chapters. It's what these 15 chapters represent. The first thing he knows is he always has to remain connected to his father and grandfather. The 15 Shir Hamalas and representing the 15 years they're together. He can't just draw on his own strength. He needs Yitzchak's strength and he needs Avram's strength. But it's more than that. And here we see the intricate brilliance of how a parsha is constructed. Sometimes you learn from things that say, but sometimes you learn much more from that which is not said. They once asked a great pianist, a pianist once asked a world-renowned pianist, why are you so world-famous? I also play the piano. I also read the notes. I read notes perfectly. I sit down and I play those notes. What's the difference between you and I? And he said, the difference is in the pauses. It's the pauses that make all the difference. Chassam Seifer was once preparing a shear, and his son said, Rebbe, come on, you know it already. What are you preparing? He said, I'm thinking what not to say. There's that which is said, and there's that which is not said. That which is not said is usually much more important than that which is said. But how do you know that which is not said? You know it from absence. You don't know it from presence. It says in Chazal that Moshe Rabbeinu's face, the Gepostic says Moshe came down from the mountain and his face was bright. Koran Erpne Moshe. Nobody could look at him. He had to put on a mask. Why? And you know what the Gemara Chemedrish says? Medrash Rabbah says, Parashas Kisisa. When Moshe was writing the Sefer Torah on Har Sinai, he had a pen, so to speak, and he was taking dictation like a secretary. And he was writing the Sefer Torah. Hashem says, Moshe is taking dictation word for word. And then at the end, there's diyosh and eshtayr b'kol masoy. There is ink that remains in the quill. And Moshe sees this ink, and he rubs it over his face. And this creates his brightness. And now I ask you, God couldn't figure out how much ink he needed in the pen? I understand. I buy a pen. I don't know exactly how much ink I need. I have ink left over in the pen. Shem could have figured out probably how much ink we need and how much ink is unnecessary and not put it in the pen? The answer is, there's the Sefer Torah that's written, but then there's the ink in the pen, that which was not written. That's the ink that remains in the pen, what God held back, so to speak, what's contained in the quill, what is not said. Your children learn much more from what you don't say than from what you say. It's much deeper, it's much more subtle. That's where Moshe's light came from. From the absence, from the pauses, 
The Gemara says that any letter in a Sefer Torah that is not surrounded by empty space from all four sides, it disqualifies the Sefer Torah. It has to be mukov gvil me arba ruchas, surrounded by white parchment from all four sides. Why? Because that's the ink that remains in the quill. There's the ink that comes out in the letter, and then there's the white around the ink, which is that which could not come out in the letter. That connects to the ink that remains bekul masai. From that which is not said, you could sometimes learn much more than from that which is said. Mitzvah loisasa says Lakota Torah is deep, are deeper than mitzvah's essay. The not is always deeper than the yes. What you say no to represents a deeper connection with your values than what you say yes to. And so, Vayetze Yaakov mi Be'er Sheva Vayela Kharana. Yaakov leaves Be'er Sheva and he goes to Kharan. He leaves from there till his return when he meets a new set of angels. There's no space. There's no gap. Yaakov Avinu would not allow for a gap, even one moment, from when he leaves till he returns. The fact that there's no psuchas and stumas and parshas of Ayetze is because it represents the underlying absence of a gap in Yaakov's life between his departure, his mission, and his return. The great challenge of every soul is we grow up in a certain environment, in a certain place, in a certain space. Some of us have been lucky to grow up in very nurturing environments. Some people remember their mother's strudel cake, or cinnamon buns, or chalapzas, or Yerushalmi kugel fakein yidin gedacht, and their hearts melt in warmth. And other people didn't have that upbringing. Some people grow up in environments that are very, very warm, uplifting, elevating, inspiring. You ask them about the homes of their youth and they swell up with tears of nostalgia and sadness coupled with joy for something that was so special. Some people speak about their parents and there's a glow on their face. They speak about their father, there's a glow. They speak about their mother, their grandmother, an aunt, an uncle, there's a glow on the face. And others sadly speak about these people and there's a darkness that overtakes their face. There's a void, there's a sadness, so much regret, so much unresolved anger or pain or trauma. Whether intentional or unintentional, I'm not now, this is not about judgment, this is about the reality that people face in their own lives. And Yaakov Avinu is the first one who has to establish that truth. How could you go into an environment in which you're constantly triggered by alien forces that can completely destroy you. So Yaakov Avinu says, make sure you never allow for an empty space between where you are and where you came from. Where you came from is that your soul is a chelik eleikami mal mamash. Your soul is one with the divine. Your soul, still in the womb of its mother, was completely protected by the divine with a candle over your head learning the whole Torah. A person's soul comes from a place that is completely, completely one and integrated, full of confidence, full of happiness, full of joy, full of endless possibility, promise, inquisitiveness, curiosity. The soul is as innocent and pure as it gets. It's not traumatized. A soul is never traumatized. A soul is never blemished. A soul is never tainted. A soul is never tarnished. You always have to have that reference point. And the trick is, or the awareness that's needed is, don't let anything get in between that source and where you are today. Don't allow any circumstances to fill the gap between where you were and where you are today. Always allow yourself to see yourself from the point of view of your origin, from the point of view of your source, from the point of view of who you really, really are. Imagine, imagine, if you can go back in your life, and this is true about every single one of us, we weren't always big girls or big boys who have to go home and prepare a house and with a lot of duties and responsibilities. Every single one of us At some point, we're not going to get into the years. 
were formed and developed in a womb. What was your experience in that womb like? What was my experience in that womb, in that womb like? My brother told me once about a workshop he observed where the person running the workshop had everybody in a room, eyes closed, dark, very serene, very quiet. And there was just one noise that was reverberating, that was resonating in the room, and he couldn't figure out what it was. And then he realized it was a heartbeat. It was a heartbeat. And after a while, the leader of the workshop says to the people, this is what you heard for nine months. This is all you heard for nine months, the heartbeat. Could you go back to that place? And what did you expect to come out to? In that place, in that space, you were in an amniotic sac, in a mikveh, completely protected. The Gemara says in Nida, there's no time as good as life. There's no time in life that is as good as the time that a fetus is in the womb of its mother. They teach the fetus the entire Torah. In fact, the reason we make a Shalom Zachar when a baby boy is born is because when you leave the womb, they forget the whole Torah and the baby is upset. So we create a party Friday night to celebrate the baby. So somebody said, why don't we make a Shalom Nekeva? The answer is because they don't forget. <clears throat> That's the truth. They don't forget. It's not just cute. It's not just cute. But I'm glad you find it cute. So what we have here is in those, what did you expect to find when you came out? Every child, every fetus has a lot of consciousness, even if the consciousness is dormant. And what we expected and what we felt was to come out to a world that will protect us with the same warmth of the womb. Some of us are fortunate to have glimmers of that, but many, many are not. Some at a very young age and some at an older age. There are people sitting here in this room right now who every person that they felt they could trust in life betrayed them. And again, some of them may have done it completely unintentionally. But what does that do to this child? What does that do to that heartbeat? What type of space is created between who we are and who we really are? Is it pasuach or is it sasum? Well, we have two challenges. Some of us become closed. It's called sasum. There's so much space and we're closed off from both sides. Some of us become completely open in the attempt to reclaim that sacred space. But it all comes because there's a gap. What Parshas Vayetze tells us is that Yaakov said, don't allow the gap, just like I didn't allow the gap between me and Yitzchak and Avram. That's the 15 Shir Hamalasan. I took one deep breath when I left Be'er Sheva. And I didn't fully exhale till I came back 20 years later. In other words, I saw it as one journey. I never allowed the vicissitudes, vicissitudes, and fluctuations and roller coasters of life interfere and interrupt my integrity. Whenever you wake up in the morning, the first thing you have to say, the Chazal instituted, what's the first thing you have to say? To go back to that heartbeat. To go back to that heartbeat. Rabba Emuna Secha. Great is your faith in me. Great is your faith in my soul. You wash your hands. And now you could say God's name. And what's the first thing we say? Eloikai Neshama Shanasata Bi Tahira He. The soul you have imbued within me is pure. Tahira doesn't only mean pure in Aramaic. Tahira means light. It's full of light. There are texts that take out the word he. The Chida even brings a suggestion to take out the word he. Because he says it's not pure anymore. Neshama shanasata bi tahira. It was pure. But look in any siddur. They kept the he. Neshama shanasata bi tahira he. It is pure. Sometimes a person looks at themselves and they see themselves as damaged goods. I'm tainted. I'm tarnished. That heartbeat did not remain with me. That protection did not remain with me. I ended up in Haran. I ended up in a world of anger, in a world of frustration, in relationships that are filled with anger. Anger means they're filled with pain. There's a lack of trust. There's a lack of reliance, which of course produces anger, which usually covers up tremendous loss and tremendous pain. 
Sometimes the anger is explicit, sometimes it's, it's repressed or, or suppressed, which only makes it deeper and greater often. But the truth is, he, the purity remains completely intact. There's no real gap, there's no psucha, and there's no stuma. From the moment Yaakov left Be'er Shava till he comes out, he saw it as one absolute link, one absolute chain with no disconnection even for a moment. The circumstances changed. The realities changed. That's why he went to the yeshiva of Shem and Aver. He needed different angels completely. He needed different angels. But he knew that it's the same connection being manifested in a different way. It's the same soul being manifested in a different way. That's why this 15th Shira Malison, because he had to draw on the 15 years that he was together with Yitzchak and Avram Avinu. And you know, I want to share with you a, uh, the very famous story, I mean, I'm not sure some of you have heard it, but Reb Meir of Primishlan. Reb Meir Primishlan was one of the great Hasidic masters, and he would go every morning to the mikveh, men's mikveh, and there was a shortcut, you had to go on top of the mountain and then down the mountain, the mikveh was on the bottom of the mountain. But in icy days, it was dangerous to go on the mountain and then come down on the mountain. So everyone would take a long roundabout path to get to the mikveh. But Reb Meir continued to go on and go down. In that city, there were a group of people. They were called Maskilim. They considered themselves very enlightened. And they would always mock Reb Meir of Primishlam. They mocked him as a, as a fake, as makes himself saintly and is not a real person. And uh, when the people in the city said, don't make fun of him, he's a, re- he's a true person. Nobody goes to the mikvah up the mountain and down the mountain and remains intact. They said, that's not a big deal. He just knows how to ski a little bit. And of course, the next morning, in order to prove their point, this group of people went up the mountain, went down the mountain. They, sl- they slipped. And they really hurt themselves and maimed themselves. So they came to the mayor. They asked forgiveness. And they said, but how do you not slip in the morning? And he said, as Ms. Sugebunden Oiben, Faltmanisht, Unten, meirul is zugebunden oiben, faltenisht unten. When one is tied above, one does not fall below. I am anchored in the above, and therefore I don't fall below. In other words, what he was saying is, there's no psucha and stuma. There's no gap between the origin and between where I am. So basically... Reb Meir was saying, every person has to be anchored in your highest place. Don't dupe yourself. Don't deprive yourself. Don't let life dupe you. Don't get gypped. Don't deprive yourself of your highest self. Yaakov Avinu geographically leaves Eretz Yisrael, but in his mindset... He remains anchored in a God-centered world. When you're anchored in a place, whatever you face, whoever you face, you are so anchored, you're so connected, you don't fall. But if you allow a gap, if you allow an empty space, now you're suspended. Now you need other people to hold on to you. Now you say, come, help me stand, help me stand, and then I become often subjected to this person's expectations, that person's expectations, this person's issues, that person's issues. Yaakov remained one with his roots. He was continuing the story in a new environment. He didn't allow a break between his origin and his new condition. There was a professor in uh, Ben-Gurion University, talking about Be'er Sheva, Vayetzi Yaakov me Be'er Sheva. There was a professor I knew who taught... uh, in Ben-Gurion University in Be'er Shava. He passed away a number of years ago. His name was Professor Velvel Green. He was an astrophysicist. And uh, he once related the following story. He said, many years ago, a noted scientist delivered a lecture at a space science conference. And he spoke about the broader aspects of... Uh, space science and the space administration program in the USA and the lecture drew a parallel between the following issue 
The problems which are going to face space explorers in the future and our current conditions on Earth. And he wanted to bring out his idea, so he said as follows. He said, I want to use a hypothetical voyage to the nearest star. We want to, man wants to create a voyage to the nearest star, which requires remarkable engineering. There are biological problems, sociological problems, because to execute such an enterprise is really a great feat. The star is 4.3 light years away. Remember, a light year is not our year. Light travels 186,000 miles per second. So this star that we want to get to, close star, <laughs> is 4.3 light years away. A spaceship traveling 1,000 miles per second would require more than 800 years to get from Earth to that star and more than 800 years to get back. 4.3 light years. You get into a spaceship. You're not going to the moon. You're not even going to Mars. You got to get to this place. And even if you're going a thousand miles per second, it's more than 800 years to get to this star. Here's the problem. Any original crew that you put into the spaceship, they won't survive even during a fraction of the mission's duration. So what do you have to do? So you would have to fill the spaceship with men and women who are going to have to create a house in the spaceship. And they would have children. And they would carry on the mission. And they would give it over to their children and their children and their children for 1,600 years. 800 years there, 800 years back. After many, many years, the original progeny of the first crew would complete the mission and come back to Earth. See what some lectures are like. Now, this spaceship will have to be self-sustaining, self-supporting. But that's the technical side of it. But there's one more side of it. And that is, the crew will have to learn to tolerate each other for many, many years. Not the first generation only. Generation after generation. They would have to learn very quickly that you can't blow up only one part of the spaceship because you don't like the person near you. But here, he said, is the biggest problem. Would the 50th generation, after a thousand years, still share the aspirations of their pilgrim fathers and mothers who set out from Earth a millennia ago? How indeed can you convey and be confident that there's a generation unborn and you're going to convey to them information about where they came from, where they're going, how to get there and how to get back when they don't even know of any other reality. After a thousand years, they're born in a spaceship. They don't know there's something called Earth. They know nothing about the star. It's a tradition of a tradition of a tradition of a tradition. We're coming from somewhere. We're going somewhere. we got to get back. Professor Velvel Green, who became a Balchuva in the 1960s, worked for NASA for, worked for NASA for many, many years, says, at that moment, a scientist stood up, and he said, these words, if we could figure out how the Jews managed to survive these thousands of years, we have the answer. Essentially, what this scientist was describing was this exact story. This exact narrative. A narrative that continues for thousands of years. Passed on from generation to generation to generation who weren't there in the original generation. With a mission, with maps, with a spaceship. So he says, if you could figure out their secret and we could translate it to the world of astronomy and space exploration, we will be doing a very good job. What's the answer to that? The first answer to that is... There's no psuchos and stumos in Parshas Vayetze. Yaakov made sure that he would not have a gap so that his children and grandchildren till today will not have a gap. The terrain will change. The scene will change. The part of space will change. Everything will change. But the relationship, the connection, the attachment at the core will not change. Which explains finally why Yaakov for 20 years could keep on 
repeating 15 chapters that all begin with the word Shir Hamalos. And what does Shir mean? Shir means actually a song. And when you speak about a song, a song represents joy, celebration, jubilation. And the question is, granted, he has power to sustain himself. Why is he excited? He tells Lavan, I didn't sleep at night. The heat and the cold was difficult. Why are you singing? They told an old anecdote in yeshiva about this kid who comes home and he got a C on everything, a C on everything. But dancing lessons, he got an A. And his father sees him, he sees the A, and gives him a frask. He said, I don't understand. This you should celebrate. So he says in Yiddish, Nish the Lenin, Nish the Davis, Nish the Fit, Tanz noch? You fail in everything and you still have Koyach to dance? Why was Yaakov dancing? Much of Tehillim is not sheer. Much of Tehillim is about the expression of agony and suffering. But Yaakov for 20 years was singing. Shir Hamalas. But it's all the same point. Yaakov never failed to see his journey as a mission. He never failed to see that there's not only light at the end of the tunnel, but because the entire journey is one of soul exploration. His soul, which is infinite, was sent into this journey. So every state of the journey he understood as an opportunity for new awareness, for new growth. He saw it as a springboard, as a catalyst for tremendous achievement. Yaakov understood he wasn't plunged into darkness for the sake of darkness. Every situation he was sent into was with the objective of transforming the darkness into light, of bringing the light into that darkness. And because he could see clearly the mission, the purpose, and never get confused, he was always sugebund and oibin. He never allowed himself to detach from the origin as the challenge of that spaceship. Therefore, he could sing. Darizal says the reincarnation of Yaakov was Rabbi Akiva. Akiva is the same letters like Yaakov. Akiva is ayin kuf yud beis, yud beis, with an aleph. Akiva was a Gilgal of Yaakov. Rabbi Akiva married a woman named Rachel, who was a Gilgal, who was the spark of Rachel, who was Yaakov's wife. And about Rabbi Akiva it says that he and his friends came to Mount Scopus and they tore their clothes. And then they came to the Harabayas and they saw a fox coming out of the Holy of Holies and everybody cried. And Rabbi Akiva was mesachic. Rabbi Akiva was laughing and they said, why are you laughing? This is a Gemara at the end of Tractate Makas. He said, why are you crying? They said, how can we not cry? Look, this is the holiest place of the world and now foxen, shawalim hilchabai, foxen come out. And Rabbi Akiva says, that's why I'm laughing. Because in this very destruction he saw the beginning of Genesis. Tzio in Sadate Kharish. He saw in the exile the genesis of redemption. He understood that he wasn't sent in to face this trauma just for the sake of entering into a place of Choron. Rabbi Akiva, like his grandfather, like his Nitzutz, Yaakov understood the power of Shir Hamalis. He can always sing, not because he was naive, not because he was in La La Land, not because he was alienated from reality, not because he didn't know of the pain of being in Lovin's house. You see, clearly he knew, but he could still sing. And the reason he could sing Shir Hamalos is because he had that ability to be able to recognize that there's a depth there, that there's a meaning here. He's being challenged to bring out his best, to flex his ultimate muscles, to bring out, the, to unleash his atomic nuclear energy, to be able to unleash the deepest lights of the soul. That's why he could say, Shira Malois, he could sing. The 15 chapters are not just 15 chapters of Tehillim, but they're all of Shir. And finally, if you look at the first one, the first one of the Shira Malison, how does it end? The first one of the 15 Shira Malison, how does it end? It starts off Shira Malis, but Hashem, Shir HaMalas al Hashem Batsarosli, Karasi Vyaneni, save me from lies, from, from lies, from deceitfulness, me lush and me. Clearly, you see, this is what Yaakov said when he came there. What are you, and he's talking to himself, what do you gain from lying? You're not going to live a good life if you're dishonest. People who lie ultimately live horrible lives. That's the first capital. And he finishes off, Ani Shalom, Vichyadaber Hema, 
Lam al Khama. He says, I am in a state of peace. But there's a whole bunch of them who come to declare war against me. What is Yaakov Avinu saying? What he's saying is, I always remain in a state of peace. Always. Even in a difficult situation, I remain anchored in peace. I don't, you don't try to give yourself tests. But sometimes God puts you into a place where there's mulchama, we have to battle, we have to struggle. And then a person has to know that shir hamalois, not only should these battles not make you weaker, not make you depressed, not make you sad, but each of them should make you realize that here lay an extraordinary opportunity for your unbelievable, most amazing growth. And therefore you could already start singing now. You could start laughing now. And that's why the next piece, right away, Shila Malois, what does he say? Esa Enai El Heharim, Kuf I lift up my eyes to the mountains. May I in Yahweh Ezri, from where does my help come? Ezri me'im Hashem, Moises Shemayim, where is my help comes from God, the creator of heaven and earth. What's this Esa Enai? Esa Enai. I lift up my eyes. Where is he lifting up his eyes to? And the answer is, when somebody is in a state of exile, or any situation that's difficult, never ever look at it as face, at face value. Esa enai. You always have to lift up your eyes and see it from God's perspective. Never look at a challenge or a trauma, any difficulty, and just say, this is what it is. Esa enai. Lift up your eyes. You need to have a much grander perspective. I have to be able to lift up my eyes to the mountains, to the peaks of reality, to the origin. Vayetze Yaakov. I have to lift my eyes up to be able to see in everything, not only what I see right now, but also what may be hidden in it. May I in Yahweh Ezri, I'll often ask, from where does my help come? And the answer that's brought in Svarim is, may I in Yahweh Ezri. The answer is the question. The way it works with pain is, when you sometimes open yourself up to your deepest pain, over there you find a lot of clarity. When you run away from it, you find no clarity. If you let all the pain to be there in its full, uninhibited expression, in a very strange way, that's where you find a lot. What do you find? May I in Yahweh Yezri. My help comes from a place called nothingness. May I in. I in represents that which I can't wrap my brain around. That which I can't understand. That which I could understand and control is not called ayin, it's called yesh. Ayin means that which is intangible. I don't have a way of describing it. I don't know what it is. I call it nothing. Not because it doesn't exist, but because it exists in a way that I cannot control it. When you look up and you say, may ayin yavah yezri, from where will my help come? And the answer is, may ayin yavah yezri, from a place of ayin. I don't have to figure it all out. I don't have to understand it. I don't have to make sense of it. The worst thing you could do for your life is look at it as a puzzle and try to make sense of it. May I in Yahweh Yezri, let yourself live in the reality, a reality that may be extremely, extremely mysterious, extremely, extremely beyond what you will ever imagine. It's not something I have to figure out, I have to make sense, but be here. Remain here. Because in this nothingness, in this may I in, there is an I in. In this question, where, why, how? There is something called ayin, there is something called infinity that is beyond your comprehension, beyond your imagination. And when you could sit in the may ayin, you don't have to run from it. You will be able to discover in some inexplicable way a resource, an energy that doesn't rationalize and justify, but it could still hold you in its bosom and comfort you and lift you up and allow you to remain here. One of the mistakes we make is we run away emotionally from the experience, from the feeling, because it's painful. Don't. May I in Yahweh Yezri. And then he says, Ezri me'im Hashem oisei shamayim va'aretz. The help will be translated even to a state of heaven and earth. This is the second song of Yaakov Avinu. And so all the songs of the 15 Shiramalas, I'm not going to go through the 15 Shiramalas now, but all the songs of the 15 Shiramalas represent that same truth. Yaakov Avinu, in every situation, never stopped singing. Not because he did not know how to cry. Not because he did not feel pain. But because he understood that if he sits in the truth of his experience, and he sits there with genuineness and with authenticity, he will find a unique music. A music that will not only allow him to sustain himself, 
but allow them to sustain generations and generations of children. Thousands of years later, not only 1,600 years later, as in the theoretical spaceship, but 3,600 years later, you can add another 2,000 years to that spaceship. And the children who are still singing the 15 Shira Malison of Yaakov have a wonderful week. Yes, you're welcome. David HaMelech wrote it. Could be it was a tradition he got from Yaakov Avinu, or could be he wrote it based on the themes of Yaakov Avinu, or could be Yaakov Avinu maintained the theme of the 15 chapters but not in the same wording, etc. You're welcome. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.